Hi, Josh. Hi, Will. How you doing today? Things are good. Uh, well, thanks for coming on. Uh, I guess this is free will, uh, even though everyone knows Josh Nope, who's a regular uh, on uh, Blogging Heads TV. So I'm Will Wilkinson uh, from the Cato Institute. Uh, and Josh, uh, you are? I'm a professor at UNC Chapel Hill in the philosophy department. Excellent. And you are one of a handful of experimental philosophers, which is uh, sort of unusual. A lot of people people think of uh, philosophy as uh, speculations from the armchair. So uh, that's new. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, experiments and empirical methods in philosophy and in social sciences. So uh, Josh's specialty is uh, using experimental methods to test hypotheses about uh, people's philosophical intuitions, uh, and uh, and one of my specialties is looking at experimental and behavioral economics and what its implications are for politics and policy. So uh, the idea, Josh, is that you can talk a little bit about uh, the sort of stuff that's in the new collection that you've got out with Sean Nichols, holding it up to the screen, <laughs> called Experimental Philosophy, uh, and We'll run through a few uh, uh, experiments uh, that uh, illuminate the nature of experimental philosophy and the kinds of insights it can give us. And then uh, we'll move on and talk a little bit about uh, behavioral economics and uh, what's going on with uh, empirical methods in the social sciences. Uh, that sound good? Sounds like a good plan. So tell us a little bit about uh, your uh, the volume that you've edited with uh, with with Sean, uh, and you know in general what experimental philosophy is, and then we can start talking about some experiments. So experimental philosophy is a new movement within philosophy that just started in the last couple of years. And the essence of experimental philosophy is to put to the empirical test some of the kinds of hypotheses that philosophers have been making for many thousands of years. So throughout the whole history of philosophy, even back to, say, Plato, there's been a tradition of considering certain kind of cases and then looking at the kinds of intuitions that we have about those cases. So you might say, if you wanted to know what true courage was, you might say, consider this case. Would that count as courage? Now consider this other case. Would this count as courage? And looking at these different kinds of cases, gradually develop a theory about the nature of courage. But the way in which this was done traditionally is that each philosopher would just sit in his or her armchair and just think for him or herself, okay, what is courage ultimately? And then develop certain intuitions about cases and present those in a paper just saying, consider this case. Now, surely, if you considered this case, you would think that this or that was courage or say it wasn't courage. The idea of experimental philosophy is that instead of just considering these hypotheses from the armchair, we should actually go out and test them. Mm -hmm. So we should find people from different cultures or from different groups, find people of different, uh, find different ways of examining these hypotheses and figure out what people would actually say about these cases and, more tellingly, what are the underlying psychological processes that lead people to respond as they do. So what is the actual things that are going on in people's minds that lead them to have this or that kind of intuition in the kind of cases that philosophers have been considering? Now, wh why is the... Because uh, it... It's, a, it's still like a little bit, would you say that experimental philosophy, the, the, the idea of using sort of the experimental methods of, uh, of, of empirical psychology in philosophy, that's still you know, not broadly accepted by a lot of philosophers. So what's, what, what's, what are some of the objections to doing this? Uh, why, 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 why weren't people doing this all along, for one thing? You know, especially if you accept the scientific method as the best way of gaining knowledge about the world. And uh, so, so why weren't people doing it all along, and what's the resistance to it now, insofar as they're... Do you know, do you know I, as an experimental philosopher, I'd be hesit very hesitant to just speculate from my armchair <laughs> about why people weren't doing it all along. And but, but, you're, but you're still a philosopher. You, you can speculate. Uh, so, but I think that right now, some of the objections to experimental philosophy come from real understanding of what it is and a deep sense that there might be better ways of proceeding. But I think a lot of the objection comes from just a kind of misunderstanding of what it is. That what people think 
when they hear that people are going to solve certain philosophical problems by conducting experiments, is that we're going to do something like a Gallup poll. Mm -hmm. So we'll find out that, say, 72% of subjects favor this particular philosophical view. Right. And then we'll just conclude, that philosophical view must be right. You know, <laughs> if 72% of people think it, then yeah. who are you, merely in the 28% who think the opposite, to question them? But I want to assure you, that is the very opposite of what experimental philosophy is. Philosophy has never been a popularity contest. We're not going to turn it into one now. <laughs> Rather, the idea is that by doing these experiments, we, cannot, we can learn not just what percentage of people hold each of the different views, but we can come to a deeper understanding of why it is that people hold these views. Right. So in these traditional way of doing philosophy, you just consider a certain case, you start to think about this case, and then you think, it just seems clear that such and such is right. And that would be considered to be evidence for the view. But maybe if you understood better what this underlying psychological process was that was giving you the sense that this thing had to be right, maybe that would give you a better sense of whether you should trust in your intuition or whether you wouldn't. And sometimes these experiments suggest the underlying psychological process is maybe one that we should have a lot of trust in. Mm -hmm. And other times, the very opposite. They seem to suggest that when we really understand why we're having the intuitions we do, we should have put much less faith in them than we originally did. So would I be right to think of this is an extension of... So when I was first going into grad school in philosophy, the idea of um, sort of naturalized epistemology was still fairly new, uh, which was the idea that, that uh, we could actually think about the different kinds of cognitive processes that led people to form their beliefs and to make judgments uh, about the sort of truth and falsity of various propositions. And we could see whether these different mechanisms, uh, you know, in the mind and brain would be likely to be the sorts of things that would track the truth about the world. And that there, that there's, so, so the question of when people have a, uh, a justified belief is going to be, for instance, a certain, you know, view of justification, a reliabilist view would say, well, it's, it's justified just in case it was formed according to a, uh, a, a, a set of mechanisms that tends to reliably uh, track the truth. And once you start <laughs> thinking about that, then you start wondering about whether the mechanisms by which we form moral judgments about cases, you know, cases about trolleys going down tracks and about, uh, you, know, you know, pushing buttons and giving people an infinitesimal amount of pain. Like, are ju what, what's the mechanism that's generating those judgments, and are they reliable or not? Would, you, it, would it be right to see that what you're doing is an extension of that earlier program of sort of reliable naturalistic epistemology? Or is it something yes, that's, exa that's exactly right. So what you're pointing to here is the idea that there were these people decades ago who found, created a kind of foundation, a sort of intellectual foundation, for the kind of philosophy that's going on now. So these people founded a new kind of approach to philosophy, which is now known as naturalism. So the basic idea of naturalism, as you point out, is something like this, that you might have thought philosophy was supposed to serve as the kind of foundation of all subsequent knowledge. So you might have thought that philosophy should sort of stand apart from all of the sciences and develop certain ideas independent of the sciences, which would then serve as something like the groundwork for those sciences or something of that sort. But these philosophers, the philosophers that we, the new generation, admire and look up to and try to extend the work of, thought of the things in a very different way. They thought, we just shouldn't worry too much about this whole distinction, the idea that there's supposed to be science and philosophy, mm -hmm. and they're supposed to be distinct in this way and related in a particular sense. Rather, the two just meld insensibly into each other. And the way that we should think about it is that we just start off with this web of belief that includes scientific beliefs and beliefs about what are the best methods are, and then, without ever forming an ultimate foundation or anything of that sort, we just use each of these beliefs to adjust each other. So sometimes we use our scientific beliefs to change our beliefs about what are the best methods. Sometimes our beliefs about what are the best methods to change our scientific beliefs, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's uh, you know, uh, so uh, Quine would have been uh, the guy that people associate most with this sort of web of belief idea. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. first. So um, Quine, this philosopher that you mentioned, he's kind of my intellectual grandfather, that is to say, my advisor's advisor. Yeah, your, your, your advisor's advisor. Uh, is quiet. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, for, for a while, my advisor's advisor was quiet as well, and, and I see myself as a kind of quietian, so... Uh, 
So yeah. we're sort of intellectual cousins. Or something. Yeah, we're kind of intellectual cousins. Yeah, when I was doing philosophy of mind and language, I was studying with a student of student of mine. Um, so, well, one of the first, um, uh, well, one of the pioneers in sort of naturalistic uh, epistemology and sort of reliableist theories of justification was uh, Robert Nozick uh, mm-hmm. uh, from uh, from Princeton and uh, from Harvard. I'm sorry, and uh, and he's also he's most famous for his work in political philosophy, which includes this thought experiment uh, called the experience machine, and I understand that you, uh, and, uh, well, who's, yeah, you have an experiment about the experience machine, uh, so tell us about the, uh, the experience machine, the uh, thought experiment, and the, uh, the scientific experiments that people are doing about it. Oh, so first I should clarify that this experiment is not by me, but by the philosopher Felipe de Brigard, who is yeah. a, now a graduate student at UNC. So the basic idea of the experience machine thought experiment is it's supposed to make us think about whether what we truly want in life is to be happy, to achieve happiness or pleasure. So the great philosopher Robert Nozick decided maybe we can settle this question by imagining a thought experiment. Imagine there's this machine, the experience machine, if something kind of like the matrix... If you go into this machine, you'll just be lying down uh, inside this machine, just sort of lying there, doing nothing. But the machine will stimulate your brain such that you have an experience exactly as though you're having this wonderful, interesting new kind of life. Mm -hmm. So you'll no longer think that you're this researcher at Cato Institute doing interviews on blogging heads. (laughs) You'll think you're this rock star who's having this incredible life with huge fans, of you know, swarms of adoring fans tra- trailing you everywhere, having exciting adventures all the time, you'll be feeling incredibly happy and incredible feelings of pleasure all the time. Yeah. However, even though you'll be experiencing all this pleasure, none of it will be real. The real truth is that you'll have abandoned everyone you know and you'll just be lying there in this machine. Mm-hmm. The question he asks then is, if that was the case, would you decide to enter the machine? Or would you prefer just to continue with your real life where you might not be having as much pleasure, but you'd be truly experiencing something that was more in, was connected with reality in this important way. So in this version of the thought experiment, which would you choose? Would you rather go into this machine and experience this pleasure all the time, or would you rather stay out and continue your real life? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's an argument against sort of subjectivist theories of value. It's supposed to be, mm-hmm. right? Because our, our intuition that knows it assumes that we, most of us, share this intuition that we prefer to have real authentic engagement with our experience um, even if it was less pleasurable than this uh, mm-hmm. synthetic world. So there's mm-hmm. this, this, so he's trying to establish the view that there's something about this, there, that we care about more than just our internal states, that we care about mm-hmm. our real relationship to the world, even if we don't ex- directly experience that. Right, mm-hmm. so that's that, that's the idea. And but the but the idea is that okay, this argument is going to work. This argument is convincing only insofar as people actually share do share this intuition. Um, mm-hmm. And so the the study is trying to tell us something about the intuition. So tell us about this study. Right. So first of all, studies have shown that people do have exactly the intuition that knows success that we should have. Mm-hmm. That is to say. Given the story that I just told you, most people say that they wouldn't go into the machine. Mm -hmm. Just as Nozick suggested, they say they'd rather go out and have their real life. But now a question arises, why do people feel that? What is the kind of fundamental psychological process that's leading people to feel that? Mm -hmm. What you might initially think is that it's that people have a certain kind of value. They have value reality. That is to say, they value being connected with the real world. But what De Brigard wanted to argue is that this view is a mistake. There's a different kind of psychological process taking here, taking place here. One that doesn't have to do with connection with reality, but has to do with a certain kind of bias that's been well documented with behavioral economics. Mm-hmm. So he decided to show this by offering a new version of the experience machine case. So this version works a little bit differently. Suppose here you are interviewing me for this blogging heads show, mm-hmm. and then suddenly bloop, there's like a strange thing all of a sudden, all of your reality disappears, uh-huh. and you wake up in this machine, and someone tells you, well, oh, we're sorry, there's been this terrible error. There was a mistake. A long time ago, you decided to enter into this machine, and at that time, you weren't really this exciting person, serving as a fellow at the Cato Institute, <laughs> living an exciting life in Iowa, doing research on all these interesting topics mm-hmm. on behavioral economics. 
rather you were a total loser and you wanted to yeah. escape that life and we told you we can put you into this machine that will allow it to be uh, you to have the illusion that you're living this exciting life doing all these interesting things and at that time you chose this life this is exactly so what I would pick in fact living the dream <laughs> so this but suppose that this dream that you think you're living yeah. really is a dream mm-hmm. that all of these things that you think of experiencing all of your closest friends your girlfriend your parents they're all illusory none of these things are real right. and now you're being given the opportunity you can leave this illusory life you've been living all along and go to some reality you don't even know right. or if you prefer they say no problem you can just go back into the machine we'll flip it on you won't even remember that you came out of the machine and you'll just continue your die of luck mm-hmm. so in that case which would you choose uh, I want to keep talking to you Josh Right. Oh, see, that's exactly what most people chose. Mm. So it didn't seem then that people had a steady preference for reality. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that people always chose reality. Rather, what people seemed to be interested in, in was not reality, but in just making things stay the same. Mm-hmm. They wanted the status quo, the things that w- the way that things currently were, to just remain. So the original experiment, it seems, wasn't tapping into a true value that people have of valuing reality. Rather, it was seemed to be tapping into what behavioral economist, economists have sometimes come to call the status quo bias, or in other terms, the endowment effect. So maybe I could turn things over to you, actually, as the behavioral ac- economist of our dialogue, and you could ex- give, explain a little bit what this kind of bias is all about. Uh, well, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the uh, endowment yeah. effect. Who, who did it discover the endowment effect? Was it Thaler? Knatch and... Who did? Thaler and Knatch are, well. Thaler and Knetsch are both so associated with it. This okay. famous experiment with the mugs. And so. Yeah, so the experiment is, you know, you, the yeah. initial experiment uh, was, uh, you know, a bunch of, you know, undergraduate students, and as, uh, you know, one of the weaknesses of experimental psychology is it's uh, a reliance on undergraduate mm-hmm. students. But uh, you, you hand out a bunch of free stuff to people in the class, uh, and so there's like a, bu- uh, you know, you give somebody a mug that's worth about a buck fifty or something like that. Um, and once you give it to them, uh, and it's theirs, and it's their mug, uh, then you, uh, you know, give them an offer. Um, you know, like, would you, will you exchange this mug for a certain amount of money? Uh, and, uh, and I'm not setting it up correctly, uh, because what you're comparing it against is how much the students are willing to pay for the mug in the first place, versus how much you have to pay them to give it up, right? That's the idea. And mm-hmm. so the amount that the students are actually willing to pay if you give them a little bit of money uh, and then you offer to let them buy a mug is a certain amount of money. Um, but once you give them the mug, they re- they demand to be compensated for more than uh, they would have been willing to pay for in the first place. Um, so that's exactly. the, so the, the idea is that once people have something, they value it um, more than before they had it. Um, they wouldn't pay as much to get it as you would have to pay them to give it up. Um, so that kind of builds in a certain kind of bias for the status quo, for a, mm-hmm. a conservative bias for what you already have. Um, and so that would help explain a case like, like this. Right, exactly. So when we originally came across this intuition, we think, oh, this is showing some deep thing about the true nature of human values. But in the case, for example, of the mug, it seems as though it's, there's obviously a sense in which what people are doing is irrational. It violates certain kind of economic assumptions. It's not what people would as- expect on rational choice theory. And what we're seeing now is that these philosophical intuitions that were supposed to guide our whole theory about the nature of value mm-hmm. might be actually shaped by these same kind of biases that we see coming out really obviously in a case like the one of the muck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, so the, and, that, and that's a big problem for certain kinds of theories of economic rationality because you assume mm-hmm. that people's preferences over items um, is uh, that, that that their possession is irrelevant to how you know how highly they rank it relative to uh, other goods, but mm-hmm. it turns out not to be the case. So you can have mm-hmm. cases where uh, where people's preferences can look like they're intransitive, or cases in which um, exchanges that would otherwise seem optimal or efficient won't take place because people are placing you know, too much value on the things that they already have, uh, even though they would each be better off if they had actually exchanged them in some other context. 
So right. So the case you gave with the mugs is an excellent example that if things work that way, no one will ever be able to trade because it ends up that no one who has a mug would be willing to accept as much money as the people who have money would be willing to give for a mug. Mm-hmm. Now, it's interesting. Uh, let, let me give you a, a, an experimental result uh, about the endowment effect, if I can remember it off the top of my head. There's a, there's a, a behavioral economist at the University of Chicago. I think believe his last name is List. Um, mm-hmm. And one of the criticisms of certain kinds of behavioral economics has been that it's all in the laboratory or, uh, and that you're presenting people with novel situations. But when people actually have money to lose and gain out in the real market, you'd expect there to be a learning process that debiases people, because people who stick with these biases can turn out to get exploited and be losers uh, in exchanges. Um, and so one of the experiments that I believe List did had to do with um, giving out pins. I think he did one with, with collectible pins, and maybe he did one with baseball cards as well. So there are people who... Uh, as their hobby, collect and trade these pins. Uh, And if you give them a pin, um, do you get the same results as you get in uh, the sort of like mug-like experiment? And it turns out that you don't. That people who who are used to evaluating the market value of the thing that you've handed them um, will tend to actually be willing to trade it for that value. Um, So the existence of the endowment effect uh, or its interference with uh, trade uh, often depends on the familiarity of the, uh, the the item that you've given to people and their experience in markets that trade that good. Um, and so there's a sort of like an extra layer in which you have sort of a first order level of behavioral economics where you're doing these things in the laboratory to test whether or not traditional assumptions about rationality are true. Um, but then you might worry that the ration, that the that people's behavior in laboratories isn't going to be sufficiently representative of their you know what you might call their ecologically embedded behavior, their behavior really out in the real world. So, so List is doing things that are more like natural experiments, going and seeing what people uh, actually do do. Um, you know, you make certain. Uh, you know, very targeted interventions uh, in order to be able to conduct an experiment, but you can, it's more about observing people's uh, uh, behavior in their natural context. And so you get a slightly different result if you sort of change the background parameters, like whether somebody's in a laboratory or whether they're in a market trading things that they're used to trading. And so as the side of science progresses, it gets more and more um, rigorous, and we start to see, uh, I think, finer and finer grain results. Um, you see that these biases aren't necessarily universal. It's partly a, uh, a function of context. And then that becomes very complicated to, to start teasing out which con- under which context people will behave in which ways and which, which context they will. But yeah, do so. you think, in the experiment that you just described, it seems as though there are two different variables. So on one hand, there's the distinction between being just in a laboratory and being mm-hmm. ecologically embedded. On the other hand, there's the distinction between trading a good that's been very often traded mm-hmm. and trading some new good that you're not familiar with trading. So do you think the relevant variable in this case is whether you're ecologically embedded or in a laboratory, or do you think the relevant variable is just whether you're accustomed to trading this particular good? Yeah, I, I think I did um, run those two things together. I think the most relevant thing in this case is just the familiarity with the good. Um, and, 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 and like people who just like trade baseball cards all the time, right? you know that... Mm-hmm. A uh, you know a Topps 1987 Wade Boggs or whatever is worth exactly this much, um, and so if you just get it handed to you, um, you just think of it as an item that has this price, and I, I do think it just has to do. Uh, but 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 to the I mean, they go together in the sense that your familiarity with the good is going to have it, it's it's going to have something to do with your prior embeddedness in a certain mm-hmm. kind of market, I would think. So do you think in the real world, it seems like what you'd expect is that people will gradually become de-biased as a new gut good comes on the market. So as people begin dealing with a new good, at first they'll show a lot of the endowment effect, and then as the time goes on, as the years go by, less and less. Does that seem like... That, that, I think that would be a, a decent prediction. Mm-hmm. I mean, what you'd expect to find, I think, and what you do find... Um, uh, what a number of people argue is that, is that um, 
that these effects about just frequency and familiarity and trading a lot and making a certain kind of decision a lot, uh, even if there is a sort of built-in tendency to make a certain kind of mistake, if you have to make this decision a lot in a competitive environment, uh, your, life, you know, your disposition to make the mistake sort of gets conditioned out of you. Um, mm -hmm. So where you should expect the least rational behavior uh, is in markets for goods that people buy very seldom. So, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, like the housing market. It's not like you buy houses a lot. I buy cereal a lot, right? You're not going to pull one over mm -hmm. on me when I'm buying mm -hmm. my, uh, you know, my, my wheat checks or my, you know, honey bunches of oats, right? I know all about that, right? Like, I know what that what the price for the box of honey bunches of oats is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I know what a good deal but is. Let's see, weddings. Yeah, or something. but you might buy a house, you know, mm -hmm. twice, three times in your life. And mm -hmm. the... And you buy them, you know, in you know, 10, 20 years apart. So the conditions of the market will have changed considerably since the last time you bought one. So the experience that you had may not no longer be relevant. So people are most likely, I think, to make bad decisions, um, you know, in, you know, given some, you know, normative standard of good and bad there, um, in those cases where they choose infrequently. Um, that's one of the arguments for, um, for instance. Um, trying to get more people more uh, earlier um, involved in in making decisions about investment. Um, you want people to actually have experience with investment markets so that they're more likely to make mistakes early on when they mm -hmm. uh, can recover and are uh, then most likely to be making good decisions by the time they're of an age when they really need to be making wise decisions about their retirement. Um, so, uh, when you see things about just experiments that just show you that people don't know much about, say, the stock market, and they're liable to make bad decisions about their stock portfolio, a lot of that's just mm -hmm. a function of inexperience. And uh, just a generation ago, many millions of fewer people had any investments at all. So, we're going through this process in which people are entering new markets, and you expect people to make mistakes when they get into new markets. Um, but you don't want to discourage people from entering mar new markets because they might make a mistake. You just want to make sure that they make mistakes, that, that, that you try to make it so that the mistakes are as, you know, as, 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 as easy going as they can be, but also that they make them at a time when they uh, can really learn from it and uh, you know, sort of improve their abilities over time. Because sort of economic rationality isn't something that people just have. Uh, it's something that you kind of have to learn in a way by, you know, being economically engaged. So I'm sorry, so I don't know about that. Any no, but I wanted to ask, are there any studies that go the opposite way? Which studies that show that even people who have really had a lot of training in business or in economics still fall prey to these kinds of, uh, of subtle biases? Oh, sure. Um, the, it, the, one of the interesting research projects in uh, experimental and behavioral economics is to see what kinds of biases are sensitive to price. Um, mm -hmm. by, by which I mean uh, whether people are likely to get rid of uh, this sort of irrationality as the cost of making the mistake goes up. And there are some things that people tend to do even as they get more experience, even as the cost goes up. And so, and, and, and studies of, uh, and, and I'm kind of winging it here to a certain extent, so I'm sorry if I can't give you the right citation to the right experiments. Uh, but the, uh, but there's a lot of it, you know, like investors, like institutional investors, uh, people who manage big portfolios, uh, all of these people are terribly guilty of a large number of biases having to do with overconfidence, uh, attributing their success to their own confidence rather than to luck, uh, and things like that. That there's, um, you know, there's pretty good evidence that shows, you know, on it, well, you just know, on average, no uh, investment manager beats the average rate of return of the market. Uh, but everybody mm -hmm. thinks that they can, and they're wrong about that. And it seems like mm -hmm. nobody ever gets over that fact. Uh, but there's a number of investment funds, um, say Andre Schleifer, who is a uh, you know a famous political economist uh, who you know he, he got in trouble a number of years back uh, for uh, his uh, for a little bit of inside dealing uh, in uh, having to do with the privatization going on in Russia, but uh, he's become 
magnificently wealthy, partly because he and others have put together funds that are based on generalizing about these biases. That if you see biases in people's behavior, you ought to be able to cash in on them in the market. And some people have made a killing uh, building models of the market that build in uh, these, you know, irrationalities. Uh, we don't know what their, you know, sort of algorithms that they use are because of course they're closely guarded. But, uh, uh, but the idea that you can actually make a lot of money doing that shows that there are a lot of people who aren't getting these biases simply beaten out of them by the market. Mm-hmm. Maybe, but maybe they will over time as people like Andre Schleifer and others make a killing off of their irrationality. <laughs> well, so tell us uh, about, uh, about another... Uh, another uh, cool experiment in experimental philosophy, Josh. Yeah, you know, maybe this time I should tell, talk about an experiment that goes in the opposite direction. So, mm-hmm. so far, we've been talking about how experimental studies can show that uh, certain kinds of intuitions, which you might have put very little, mu- might have put a lot of trust in, might actually come from cognitive processes that, once they're revealed, should make you feel a great deal of doubt. But there are also studies that seem to point sometimes in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. So, for example, there's been a lot of debate within philosophy over thousands of years about what's called the problem of freedom of the will. So within Western philosophy, this is one of the classic problems, one of the ones that we first introduce people to Mm -hmm. when they come into philosophy. The basic problem is this. Suppose it turns out that our universe is such that everything that happens at a given time is determined by the thing that happened before that. So suppose physicists discover that there are certain kind of laws that connect the things that are happening now to things that were happening a second ago. And the things that were happening a second ago to the things a second before that, and then to the things that are a second before that, all the way to the origins of the universe. So that if you sort of knew the initial conditions of our universe, you knew the laws of physics, you could kind of gradually work everything out. Mm-hmm. Suppose that was true now, even of our own decisions, even our own behaviors, so that when your girlfriend did, does some annoying thing to you, the fact that she did that annoying thing to you was actually determined by physical laws and the very initial conditions of our entire universe. It was In bound to happen. Yeah. So, suppose that happens, can it be then the case that human beings are ever morally responsible for the decisions they make? Could it be that she is really to blame for that annoying thing? Or, once you realize that it was just a natural product of certain kind of physical laws, would you have to say, well, she couldn't really be morally responsible for it? And this question is one that has haunted philosophers in the Western tradition for a tremendous amount of time, all the way back to sort of uh, certain kinds of uh, later parts of the ancient Greek philosophy. Mm-hmm. People have been concerned about this kind of issue. But so there's a kind of deep problem that arises. What, what were you going to say? No, no, no. Go ahead. But it seems like there's a deep problem that goes on, which is that when people reflect on this question for a moment, you might think maybe the reason that we're so concerned about this isn't because it's sort of a deep problem that would strike anyone capable of kind of rational cognition. But rather, maybe it's just something about our Western upbringing. Something about the kind of individualistic picture, the sort of autonomous vision of the self that comes out of a certain kind of Western culture. Mm -hmm. So maybe because of something about being, say, an American or a European, you begin to think of this as a real problem. What if we're not autonomous? What if we're slaves to past events? But maybe it's just, you might worry, maybe it's just something about us. Something about the particular kind of culture we happen to grow up in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, so there's a question about whether our... Uh, so, so, I mean, we have intuitions about uh, cases that we... You know, we use our intuitions about lots of different cases to build series of things like the nature of value uh, in the case mm-hmm. of the experience machine. But we also use these intuitions to build our sense of what the problems are, right? So, mm-hmm. so if we have this intuition that my, uh, you know, that, that, that my action was... Uh, you know, in the cards at the beginning of the universe, then I couldn't be responsible. So, so there's a particular like uh, implicit um, conditional statement there. Like, if mm-hmm. the Big Bang, you know, then no responsibility, right? Um, mm-hmm. And and we have, you know, there's nothing you know about the world that should cause you to accept that conditional. So, so maybe our intuition that that you know that if everything's determined, then there's no responsibility. Uh, maybe that's not universal, right? So maybe mm-hmm. the problem of free will and responsibility is just a problem that comes out of a certain kind of conditioning itself. That if we didn't have that kind of conditioning, we wouldn't have the sense that there's a problem here to solve 
at all. And maybe we've all been making a mistake by talking about free will and responsibility so much. Right? So yeah, what, exactly. So what does the uh, so what is the what is the uh, what is the experiment say? So in a surprising upset, in a surprising upset, the traditional philosophers were completely vindicated by the experimental results. Mm -hmm. So philosophers who have been thinking from their armchair about these questions, for example, the important philosopher Galen Strassen said, Mm -hmm. maybe there's just something in our nature, something about our nature that regards this as a problem. And the experimental results show that these philosophers were completely right. So a team of, I think it was seven philosophers led by Hagop Sarkisian, and I was, you know, the sixth of these authors, ran an experiment in a number of different cultures to see whether people had the same view about these questions or different views. So the experiment was conducted in the United States, India, Hong Kong, and Colombia. Mm-hmm. And all of these people were asked the same two questions. So it was explained to them what a deterministic universe could be like. So there's a little story about what it would be like to be in a deterministic universe mm-hmm. or an indeterministic universe in which most things proceed according to laws. But human action is different. Human action sort of violates these laws or can go any way and isn't constrained by the laws. And then they were asked two questions. The first is, which of these two kinds of universes is the one that we're living in? Do we live in a kind of universe that's deterministic or one in which human decisions can kind of go against causal laws or go in ways that are not predictable by causal laws. Mm -hmm. And the second question was, if the universe was completely deterministic, then could human beings ever be morally responsible? So in the deterministic universe, can human beings be morally responsible for their actions? Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of case that presumably most of these people have never thought about. So these typical people in Hong Kong or Colombia or India or the United States probably in their whole lives they've never given any thought to the idea of a deterministic universe and which kind of universe we live in but as soon as we asked this question to them all of these in all of these cultures the majority of people responded the same way and in fact there was no statistically significant difference across all four of the different cultures what all these people said is we ourselves live in a universe that's not deterministic but if the universe was deterministic then no one could be morally responsible and now, why? I mean, that's fascinating. That, that there's this, what, is there any idea about why it is that people think that they live in an indeterministic universe? Is it that they're reasoning backwards from. So they accept this conditional, like, mm-hmm. if determinism, then no responsibility. Um, they take for granted that it's okay to hold people responsible, and so they reason backwards to indeterminism? Is that the way? Does anybody know what the structure of uh, the relationship between these set of views is? Right, so it's very hard to tell the answers to these kinds of questions. Very difficult questions. But there's some evidence that suggests exactly the thing that you said is right. So this evidence comes from asking little children this kind of question. So children would be told, imagine, say, that little Joey wants some chocolate ice cream, and he really, really wants it, he doesn't have any urges that go in the opposite direction and so then he just takes the chocolate ice cream now if everything up to the moment he made the choice was exactly exactly the same could it be that he would not choose to have the chocolate ice cream and then in another condition subjects would be asked a different question that had more moral significance so they might say imagine that Joey stole the chocolate ice cream imagine he had this very strong urge and there was no uh, he had no interest in doing the opposite. That was all that he wanted, and then he stole it. Now, if everything had gone exactly, exactly the same up to that moment, could he have not stolen it? And what you see is a very interesting difference between these two conditions. In the case where it's not morally bad, people are much more inclined to say he couldn't possibly have done otherwise. But in the case where it is morally bad, where he does something morally wrong, people say he must have been able to do something otherwise. <laughs> and So this is a hypothesis that was actually suggested a long time ago by the 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. What he suggested is that this idea of freedom of the will is part of what he calls the metaphysik des henkers, the metaphysic of the hangman. That is, once people do something bad, we want to get them for it. We want to hang them. We want to kill them. And then we think, but how can we justify that? Well, we've just got to invent this thing called free will. And once we've invented this free will thing, then it's no problem. We have all the excuse we need to hang them. That, 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 that's fascinating. So, so let's let's apply this idea. So, you said one of the one of the things that people who 
um, has still had some resistance to experimental philosophy with the idea that, uh, you know, like, you don't figure out what the correct answer is by polling people or by doing experiments. Um, mm-hmm. So does this illuminate anything at all about the question of free will? Um, do we, so, I mean, so I uh, am a certain kind of compatibilist where I think that, mm-hmm. you know, that, 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 you know, free will and responsibility are kind of compatible with this deterministic universe. I, I would even call myself a hyper compatibilist where I don't know whether or not the universe is deterministic. Uh, but I think I know that it's a, that we can hold each other responsible. I think I know that mm-hmm. sort of for sure. That's a fixed point in my level of belief is that we can hold one another responsible. Uh, and so whether you find out that the world is deterministic or not, it's kind of irrelevant to that. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's the correct answer. So if people think that there is a uh, incompatibility between responsibility and the deterministic universe, then they're just wrong. Uh, does the, uh, you know, is there anything about these experiments that helps like adjudicate these kinds of disputes uh, that, that would do anything to say whether my position was, you know, true or whether it's false? So I think the key notion here is the notion you emphasize of that the goal is to do something to help. That is to say, it's not going to adjudicate the dispute. It's not as though once we do these experiments, the dispute will be over. It will all be completely resolved. Instead, it will provide evidence that's going to be helpful in trying to make the decision, along with many other kinds of evidence. And in this case, I think there really is some important evidence that's very suggestive here. So as you said, many people have exactly the intuition that you do. The intuition they have is that if... um, our universe turns out to be deterministic, of course, people are still morally responsible. And that's just got to be true. One thing that experimental philosophy has delved into is why people have the intuition that you have. Mm -hmm. Why do people have this intuition? And here the results are very interesting. It turns out if you just ask the abstract question, suppose the universe was completely deterministic. Mm -hmm. Imagine a universe. We'll call it universe A. Everything's totally deterministic in it. Then could anyone be morally responsible in that universe? Most people in that case say no. In fact, people overwhelmingly say no. More than 90% of people Mm -hmm. say no. But now suppose we change it. Suppose we say, imagine this universe, universe A. It's completely deterministic. Now imagine a person in this universe who who, uh, falls in love with his secretary. So he decides to leave his wife and family. And as a result, he sets up an incendiary device that burns them all to death. Is that guy morally responsible? In that case, people actually say yes. They say that he is morally responsible. So it seems like what's going on here is people have certain kinds of beliefs which just logically entail that no one in this universe could be morally responsible. But then they also have an affective reaction, a kind of emotional surge of just, I hate that guy, I want to hang them. And then once they have this emotional reaction, just as Nietzsche originally argued, people have this tendency to find some kind of justification for the claim that he really can be morally responsible. So we're getting experimental evidence that... that people's intuitions aren't necessarily coherent. Um, that, right. that, that, would be, that, that your sense of the correct answer is going to depend on what question is being asked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, see, that's that thing. So, because uh, it's kind of funny, like, when you were saying, like, my intuition about the cases, I was resisting that. I'm like, that's not my intuition. That's, <laughs> that's, my, that's my considered judgment. And because the thing is, is that I, I, I once wrote a 45-page paper on <laughs> agent causation trying to justify the idea that persons could, you know, could initiate causal change so that, mm-hmm. and the thing is, I spent so much time trying to come up with, you know, a sophisticated metaphysical account of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the causal powers of persons, and at the end of it saw that it was just completely hopeless. Um, that's when my, sort of, uh, my incompatibilist intuition died after I spent so mm-hmm. much time trying to defend uh, uh, sort of metaphysical view that I thought was sort of vindicated. Hey, you know, it's it's interesting. That, so the suggestion you bring up here is that maybe the differences between philosophers are somehow different from the differences between the judgments that ordinary folks are making about these same cases. That is to say that the reason philosophers have different views from each other is different from the reason why ordinary folks have different views from each other. And initially this was something that people in experimental philosophy really resisted. That they would say you know, these biases that we're finding among ordinary folks, those very same biases are going to be appearing in exactly the same way among people who are very sophisticated philosophers. But recently there's been some kind of evidence suggesting that the kinds of things that you're saying might be right. That people, just as you said in the behavioral economics case, that 
over time, people might develop sort of certain kinds of more sophisticated conceptions that allow them to think about these things in different ways, so that it might be that you hold this view, and also the people in some of the people uh, who are subjects in our experiment hold the view, but that the underlying psychological processes that lead you to hold the view and the processes that lead the subject to hold the view could actually be quite different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, because I just from my sort of like uh, you know self inspection uh, is that I, I went through a process that made me kind of forced me to revise my kind of web of belief because I saw that I couldn't hold there were there were uh, you know the, the set of beliefs that I wanted to um, sort of affirm there were sort of inconsistencies in it and I couldn't figure out any way to sort of iron out those inconsistencies and so at some point I just had to jettison a couple of those judgments so that my web of belief could hang together in the way that I wanted it to. And it, 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 it would seem to me sort of like strange to think that that process of, of, of reasoning and reading and arguing wouldn't actually affect your judgments over time. Um, because you know, there was a really interesting debate about this in this exact issue that you're now suggesting in the experimental philosophy literature recently. So there was a wonderful experiment by the philosophers Swain, Alexander, and Weinberg mm-hmm. in which they showed that people's intuitions about whether someone truly has knowledge, whether something counts as truly knowing something, can be subject to a certain kind of bias. And after they did this experiment, many people came back and said, yeah, it's true that certain ordinary people are subject to this kind of bias. Maybe if you just hand some questionnaire out to the man on the street, they'll be subject to this Swain, Alexander, and Weinberg bias. But if you found really thoughtful people who really deeply considered this issue, then this kind of bias would go away. People would judge these two cases, that these two different conditions where they introduced the bias, people would say they're exactly the same. And as you might expect, people like Swain, Alexander, and Weinberg were very opposed to this view. So they said, that can't be right. It's got to be the case that this bias we've uncovered is going to happen just as much with the thoughtful people as with the unthoughtful people. So, being experimental philosophers, they tried to put it to the test and conduct an experiment in which they used standard kind of personality questionnaires to examine the degree to which people were show these different kind of personality traits, distinguish those people who had a more philosophical temperament, and see what they would do. The answer was, everybody was wrong. So, the uh, philosophers who said that that sophisticated thinkers wouldn't show this bias were completely mistaken. But Swain, Alexander, and Weinberg, who said that they would show the bias, were also mistaken. What happened was, they showed the opposite bias. That is to say, it seemed as though these people were looking at the case, saw that they would probably be succumbing to a certain bias, and then tried to compensate for it. But in compensating for it, they overcompensated, and ended up making exactly the opposite kind of error. (laughs) That's fascinating. Well, because, because, I mean, and, and there's an interesting assumption there, which is that, and, and this is, I mean, this is something that's exactly, and this, this is, mm-hmm. it's interesting, the parallel here between the experimental philosophy and the, the sort of experimental economics, which is that mm-hmm. once you undercover a bias or a, or just a particular phenomenon uh, that's going on that, that, that seems to explain a certain pattern of judgment, there's a, uh, a, a tendency by the investigator to generalize very quickly that I found a sort of fundamental uh, mechanism of the human mind, the human judgment, the human behavior. Um, mm-hmm. But that, that's just a non sequitur. Uh, that if you're just being a careful scientist, you've just found that people are likely to make a certain kind of judgment given whatever the conditions were under which the people were doing the, the under which the experiment was conducted. Um, that you've got no license to generalize beyond that. If, if you're going to generalize behind, beyond that, it has to be because you already accept some auxiliary assumptions about the sort of universality of the structure of the mind, I should say, mm-hmm. um, which means that you will have already rejected hypotheses about the, uh, the sort of historical or deve- developmental or cultural contingency of certain modes and patterns of reasoning. And I think that in philosophy, that kind of sense of universality uh, is is the fault of the Chomsky voter types, who uh, mm-hmm. where people are sort of drawing on this idea that there is this universality in the underlying structure of language, so there must be the same kind of universality in the underlying structure of moral judgment. And I just mm-hmm. don't think that those two things are really analogous. 
So I think people, in the, in the case of the moral experiment, uh, or the philosophical experiment more generally, uh, I want to see people be a little bit more careful about generalizing. Uh, I think there's a lot of good evidence that sort of uh, that the underlying sort of linguistic principles of the mind really do have a certain kind of universality. Uh, but it's not clear to me when we're talking about uh, economic rationality or if we're talking about certain kinds of moral judgment. And so I think people should be cautious in their uh, in the way they universalize. You know, I myself have already succumbed to this problem. So when we first discovered this thing that this certain kind of judgment about free will appeared across all of these different cultures, mm -hmm. we immediately leaped to this very strong conclusion. We're discovering this fundamental truth of human nature. But then, shortly after we did this, the philosopher Aujo Bora decided he's going to try our experiment on engineers. <laughs> so it worked, you know, in the United States, it worked in Colombia, it worked in Hong Kong, it worked in India. Mm. Why, what if it would work in the engineering department? The answer is it doesn't. Engineers give exactly the opposite answer. They say the universe we live in is deterministic, and if you live in a deterministic universe, you can be just as morally responsible as anyone else. That's so maybe the engineers aren't quite in our species. <laughs> engineers are aliens. Well, that, that's because I, I, I've been doing a lot of work on, or for the last several years, on on the psychology of happiness and, and happiness mm -hmm. research. And one of the things that's clear um, when you're looking at that is that people's natural level of affect and their natural sort of baseline disposition to say how well they're feeling um, is very highly predicted by their answers to questions on personality surveys. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, so there's a lot of individual variability in terms of just how happy people are. But there seems like there's, there's also a, a good body of evidence that, uh, that personality traits predict um, your level of sort of how liberal you are, or how conservative you are. Uh, and mm -hmm. so people voting, you know, the, 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 the certain kinds of moral arguments uh, are going to be appealing to some groups of people, but not other groups of people, uh, mm -hmm. because those people have slightly different personalities. They have slightly different psychological dispositions uh, along a wide range. And so I think that's really, the, for me, I think that's the frontier is in figuring out how it is that individuals systematically differ from one another and how uh, developmental and personality differences lead to differences in judgments about these kinds of cases. I think once you start getting that fine grained and saying different kinds of personalities, uh, lead people to have different kinds of judgments, uh, different kinds of developmental contexts cause people to have different kinds of judgments. It starts to seem so messy at that point that it becomes discouraging, I think, to experimentalists. Um, that, you know, that, that, but I think that's just probably reality. It's messy in that way. And so if you're just going to be a good empiricist, you're just going to have to sort through the mess. But you know, I think far from it being discouraging, this is one of the most exciting kind of uh, new trends in research within experimental philosophy. So in particular, there's been some amazing work by Adam Feltz and Edward Coakley within experimental philosophy on this question. So they looked at cases in which traditionally philosophers would say, in such and such a case, we would surely say blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then they check to see whether everyone says blah, 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 or whether it's people who have certain personality traits say that, and people who have other personality traits say the opposite. So, for example, suppose we ask the question whether certain kinds of moral statements we can make, like that murder is wrong, are fundamentally true. There really is a truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. Or whether these are just sort of relative to the individual. They're true for me, but they might not be true for you. Then the traditional thing philosophers would say about this is that the ordinary intuition is that these are just true. Any philosophical account has to account for that kind of ordinary intuition. But what Felton Coakley showed was the opposite. It's not that there is one ordinary intuition that everyone has. Mm -hmm. Rather, it depends on your personality traits. People who are high in the trait of openness to experience mm -hmm. tend to think that something might be true for them, but for another person, different. People that's who are low you, in openness way, to Josh. experience. We're, 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 that's me and you. We're, we're probably both at the, uh, at the top end of the experience. So the fact that so we're, we're in this conversation uh, is, uh, is indicative. Mm -hmm. It's true. Maybe f maybe people who are even having conversations about these questions tend to be much higher on the on these certain kinds of traits. Yeah. 
if you if you're an academic, you're probably high in openness to experience. And if you're high in openness to experience, it predicts that you'll be a liberal. And if, right. you're, and if you're and if you're dispositionally liberal, it predicts at a fairly high rate that you'll vote for a Democrat. Um, right, so, so it's this is a terrible situation for our discipline because it means that all the people investigating these questions tend to have the same views about the questions. That's right, and so it gives you a false sense of the universality of the view because there's self-selection mm-hmm. into the investigators, and all the people mm-hmm. that they know are people like them. And so you're like, <laughs> is there this, who was it? Uh, the the uh, was it Pauline Kael or, or there, there's the famous line of uh, you know when Nixon became president, it's like how can this happen? I don't know anybody who voted for Nixon, right? <laughs> And I think you can get the same thing in moral philosophy, that, that if you actually had a bunch of evangelical Christians uh, in your grad moral philosophy seminar, um, you very quickly start having heated debates about extremely fundamental cases. Um, and, and the thing that's worrying about that kind of diversity is then it really calls into question the authority of theories that are built on the basis of trying to simply systematize and codify and refine a set of judgments about cases, that if we're doing mm-hmm. this kind of Rawlsian and reflective equilibrium, and that's the kind of, that's the, the method by which we're going to try to identify the correct philosophical theory, is by, you know, examining cases and then adjusting our judgments about cases, you know, you know because of our, you know, we'll, we'll shift our principles to the cases, and we'll shift our case, you know, judgments by cases to the principles, and over time, we'll come to some sort of uh, you know equilibrium between our ju- uh, between our principles and our particular judgments. Well, I mean that's going to be completely contingent on the, the kind of people who are making those judgments. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and 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 so where does that leave philosophers epistemically? So like the meta philosophical question, the meta epistemic question that arises: uh, what you know, like how are we going to try to decide what the correct philosophical answer is? If, if we're not using this method, what method do we use? Did you want to suggest something? Uh, well, my, my own view is I've become so disenchanted with it. One of the reasons why I kind of love philosophy uh, is that I started getting frustrated that uh, because I was doing moral and political philosophy with a bunch of people who had very, very different intuitions from me. Um, and the response often wasn't... Um, uh, to actually engage in the conversation. It's some, some of it is just, you know, and it's not something that's exclusive, but often you get the sense that there's something wrong with me for not having the right intuition. But I don't think there's something wrong with me for not having the right intuition. Uh-huh. I think that there's, you know, maybe those people are missing something. Uh, but, but and so that kind of experience where I wasn't, I, I lost a lot of confidence in the ability of philosophers to converge on truth through dialogue with one another, because I started seeing there being such a bad self-selection problem that the people who go into this discipline are just basically the same kind of people, and they're going to find the same kind of judgments plausible. Um, but that doesn't really give any sort of authority to the theories that they come up with, um, just because, you know, if you go over to the economics department, you'll see a similar kind of self-selection issue, where people have a very distinctive kind of personality are attracted to this field. And if you get a room full of uh, you know, neoclassical economists and analytic philosophers in a room, and you argue about policy. I mean, they'll mm-hmm. just like tear each other's head out. Um, mm-hmm. Which one of them have more authority? I actually tend to side with economists in these kinds of cases. They're people who actually understand the principles of social interaction in a, in a, in a systematic way. But, um, but, but, the, but so my answer over time has just been that, like, I don't think philosophy is very worthwhile. Um, it's just, if it's worthwhile at all, it's simply as an adjunct to experimental science, that it can be helpful in clarifying concepts, um, in, in interpreting experimental results, that in philosophy you do learn a certain kind of logical and methodological and uh, rigor in reasoning, and that's helpful in any field. Um, but there's no nothing distinctive that's left for philosophers to do. All that they can do is uh, help do experiments and help interpret them. So I think you're a paradigm case of what a good philosopher does. When you say that there's nothing distinctive for a philosopher to do, maybe wh- what you mean by that is something like, not that there's nothing for philosophers to do, yeah. but that what philosophers should do shouldn't be regarded as something completely distinct from the, what the rest of people do, but as just thinking deeply about these problems. That yeah. is to say, not having some kind of special philosophical method to which no one else has access, but of just 
thinking about these problems as best we can and trying to grapple with them using all the techniques that are available to us. So do you accept that maybe as a compromise? Not that our discipline should be abandoned, but yeah, yeah. having yeah. abandoned the idea that we have some distinctive philosophical method, we should just think really hard about these problems and try to address them. Yeah, I agree with that completely. I, I, I think I put it too strongly. Um, but because I really do think that um, and over time, as I've become de-philosophized, I've become much, much more sensitive to sort of issues about sort of anthropology and history and sociology. And I think that there's something very distinctive and valuable in the Anglo-American philosophical tradition. Um, that is an intellectual tradition that has uh, that that really uh, helps. Uh, reinforce certain kinds of norms and rigor and reasoning that are incredibly valuable generally to the intellectual community. And so I think philosophy departments uh, and, and philosophical training in the, in, in, in the sort of distinctive what you think of as the analytic tradition uh, does an excellent job of actually training people to be more rational and more rigorous and to be able to understand arguments to their structure, to analyze them at a sophisticated level. So I don't want to see philosophy departments get away. I don't I'm want delighted to think here. Yeah. Uh, Wait, so before we close, I wanted to ask you one last, uh, one final yeah. question. So I wanted to know, do you have any kind of empirical hypothesis about why it is that we philosophers tend to have such different opinions about these kind of questions from you economists? Um, well, uh, I... I wish I could claim to be an economist. I'm not why I, I'm, I'm sort of a, 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 an economist groupie. Why? Do, that, that's a really interesting question. I don't, in fact, have um, any uh, assumptions. Uh, well, I actually do. Uh, let me take that. Back. I, I think I think that there. I think I've actually seen a study, and I couldn't tell you where it is, uh, where uh, people who select into uh, economics. Uh, are people who actually find its behavioral assumptions more plausible than most people do. Um, so, uh, so I think you'll find that that uh, economists, um, you know, on average, not all economists, uh, are people who um, are more likely to see human behavior as driven by incentives that people are likely to act in their self-interest in a broad sense of self-interest. Uh, that people. Uh, attempt to make decisions um, rationally, uh, you know, in, in the sort of common sense of rationality. And so, when you take an undergraduate course in economics, people who go on in economics are like they have a, a feeling of illumination. They're like, yeah, this 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 is the way people act. This really explains the patterns that we see in the world. Um, people who, uh, you know, when, if you if you turned out to be a philosopher, um, there's a good chance that you took an undergraduate economics course, but you probably were like. This is a very vacuous view of human motivation. Mm -hmm. um, and you might drift away. With it. So my, my initial hypothesis would be that philosophers and economists early on uh, had different intuitions about the plausibility of uh, the assumptions of economic rationality. Mm -hmm. But I would like somebody to test that because uh, I don't uh, actually know how to do this myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that, that, that was that was fun, uh, Josh. I think I think we're uh, out of time, and uh, mm -hmm. that was just so stimulating because the stuff that uh, you're doing is just completely fascinating. Uh, so thanks so much for uh, uh, for uh, talking about experimental uh, philosophy, and uh, I hope I was able to say something sort of illuminating uh, about the sort of experimental uh, economics and uh, behavioral economics. So let me hold your book up again. Um, called Experimental Philosophy, uh, edited by Josh Nob and Sean Nichols. And there's a, a bunch of papers by a, uh, a large number of experimental philosophers, and it's full of these sort of fascinating results. So I encourage those who find this stimulating to go up and buy it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Josh. Uh, take care now. Bye-bye. Have a great day.